I'm here today with uh, Dr. Eugenie Scott. She's Executive Director of the California-based uh, National Center for Science Education. And for the past two decades, she's been on the front line of the continuous battle over teaching of evolution in uh, U.S. public schools. Uh, do you mind uh, just uh, informing our viewers and giving them an idea of the work you do at the National Center? Sure. Um, as it says in our byline on our website, we defend the teaching of evolution in the public schools. We're a group of scientists, teachers, uh, parents, clergy, people concerned about church-state separation, a variety of, of citizens, all of whom are united in the view that evolution should be part of the uh, science curriculum. And uh, unfortunately, in many parts of the country, it is under attack. So what we try to do is support the teachers and parents and other people in communities who want to have their kids get a good science education. And we do this through our website. We do it through um, uh, lots of uh, personal contact with people. But we really just provide the information. We are really dependent upon local people to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we really appreciate that kind of local activism. Okay. And uh, how would you consider the current state of science education in America? And are there any concerns or current states that we should be worried about? Well, science education across the board is um, uh, varies hugely. Uh, there are some districts in the United States, there's some schools in the United States where you get an education in science that is fabulous. It is better than just about any place you can think of in the world. And there's the other kind as well. And there's an awful lot in the middle. What we'd like to see as people who care about science education and science literacy, what we'd like to see is to have the um, all boats get lifted. We, we'd like to see a general improvement across the board. That's going to require um, a better understanding of how science works, you know, and real instruction to students about uh, how science is done and, and how scientists think about problems and helping them understand the method of science, but also the content of science as well. And we feel in terms of uh, a number of sciences, especially biology and geology, uh, that content also needs to include evolution. Recently, uh, you and some other top scientists and the center uh, had a very definitive success in 2005 with the Dover case, and uh, that case really showed that the plaintiff successfully argued that uh, the teaching of intelligent design is actually creationism and infringes on the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, even with this success, why has creationism and intelligent design uh, still thrived? Well, I'm trying to remember the, um, was, it, was it Andrew Jackson talking about his uh, Supreme Court justice? And now, of course, the name slips my mind, and so that makes this not as good uh, an example. But, you know, just as so-and-so has made his... Yes, thank you very much. Somebody who's closer to uh, history and uh, college-level history than I am. Uh, Justice Marshall has made his decision. Let us now see him enforce it. Uh, the fact that there are legal decisions and have been legal decisions and has been a constitutional uh, separation of, of church and state and, and uh, the fact that it's unconstitutional to advocate creationist ideas in the public schools, that's been around for a long time. That doesn't stop it happening. Uh, there are schools around the country right now where teachers are bringing creationism in as if it were science. Now, you know, now there, there's no problem in teaching about religion in the public schools. And uh, as an anthropologist, I would very much like to see more um, understanding of religion as, as something very important to human culture and human beings. But you don't advocate a particular religious view as being correct, which is what creationism and intelligent design are doing. That's something that is really unconstitutional and we shouldn't allow. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the current debate uh, that the proponents of intelligent design are moving towards is really this movement as the controversy should be taught and that it's the right of the teacher and their academic freedom to have that choice. And it seems like they're backdooring their way into affecting scientific standards. Um, mm -hmm. How are scientists and teachers and the center starting to combat this new trend and this new argument? Yeah, what, what we find when we look at the, the history of the creationist movement is, is we find a lot of the same stuff and just different emphases at different times depending on what, what's working best. And right now, because of those legal decisions that you were talking about, uh, 
right now they believe that the best strategy for them is to just argue that evolution is weak theory. They argue that evolution is something that's being abandoned by scientists, and, and which comes as a real surprise to your professors here. Uh, and that, um, therefore, teachers should be encouraged to bring in the evidence against evolution. You know, in the old days, they used to say, well, okay, teach evolution, but then uh, balance it out by teaching creationism. And then that was declared unconstitutional. Okay, teach evolution, and then balance it out by teaching something called creation science. And that was declared unconstitutional. Then we got teach evolution, but balance it out by teaching intelligent design. And we have a court decision, Kitzmiller versus Stover, on that. Now, the creationism du jour is teach evolution and balance it out by teaching the evidence against evolution. And in all cases, when you ask, well, you know, what is this thing we're balancing evolution with? Because you go to the science professors and you go to the universities and you don't find them coming up with any lists of evidence against evolution. You ask them what content a teacher is actually supposed to teach. And what you get is the same thing they used to call intelligent design, what they used to call creation science. So this is just a way of repackaging creationism to try to bring it in through the back door. Uh, I feel as a scientist myself, one of the major hurdles I have is effectively conveying complex ideas mm -hmm. and just defining science itself. Do you have a simple way of really defining science to the public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and you're right. It is very difficult, especially when you're immersed in the field. Uh, when you're, your research is there and you're tied up with all the details, it's hard for many of us to stand back and say, well, what is, what is the essential idea that a person needs to know? What's the sort of minimalist definition? For me in science, the minimalist definition is that science is a way of knowing about the natural world that is limited to explaining through natural causes. And the two components of that, the natural world, means that we're only dealing with the world of matter and energy, the, the, the natural, empirically verifiable world, so to speak. Science can't say anything about the supernatural. We can't say anything about um, whether there's a god or many gods or ancestor spirits or whatever. We can only deal with matter and energy phenomena, the natural world. Mm -hmm. And we have to restrict ourselves to explaining through natural processes, those same matter and energy processes. The reason for that has to do with the nature of science, which is to test our explanations. If you're going to test an explanation, you've got to hold constant certain variables. If there's a God, if God is active, if there are supernatural forces uh, operating, how do you hold them constant? There's no way you can control for the efforts of an omnipotent power. So you just have, if you're doing science, you just have to set God aside. It's not that you're saying there's no God, you're just saying that we don't have the tools to consider God and call it science. So science is a limited way of knowing, and a lot of people don't think of it that way. But we're limited to the natural world, we're limited to natural explanations. I just have a couple of questions about uh, kind of the future of science education in America. Uh, due to the recent elections and the new administration, are there any new national scientific initiatives or plans in the near future to fix some of the shortfalls we've had in our education so far? Well, you know, that's a question that I've been asked a lot, um, especially after the recent election. Mm -hmm. Are things going to change a lot? And uh, the thing about education in the United States is that it's really decentralized. Uh, the decisions on education, especially curriculum issues, which is what we've been talking about, what do you teach? Most of those decisions are made at the local level or the state level. Very few of those decisions are made at the national level because of this decentralization, which has always been our tradition. This is not the case with any other developed country. They all have national curriculum, but you know, we really worship our natural, natural, say that again. We really worship our local control. Mm -hmm. Now that said, uh, it's been found that having um, uh, statewide standards in math and science and history and literature and stuff uh, has been very good. It, it's really brought more more um, coherency, shall we say, to education. Um, and the movement is growing, uh, not so much being imposed by the federal government, but just sort of coming up from the states, that it would be really useful to have a national science standards document. Now, that's not the same thing as a curriculum. 
uh, national science standards would give us sort of a blueprint for what all the states ought to be doing in terms of science education, but obviously each state, again in the tradition of local control, each state would um, uh, be working toward meeting those, those standards. But that's about the only national program that I know of that, um, that is starting to grow. And it wasn't so much imposed from above. This was not something that this administration um, uh, instituted. But I have a feeling that this administration will encourage it. Okay. So it just seems like we need to take time and let it... Evolution yeah. is a slow process. <laughs> uh, and uh, my final question has to do with uh, Darwin himself. What's your favorite Darwin fact or fact about evolution that was gleaned from the origin of species? Hmm. What a great question. I've never thought about that before. Well, I think, um, I think the... the the really interesting thing about Darwin that, that very few people know is what, what, what a devoted husband and father he was. You know, everybody's image of Darwin is of this old guy with the white beard kind of looking out at the camera and he looks really dour and he looks really boring. And it's kind of hard to imagine this is a guy sort of rolling around in the grass with the kids, you know. But he was a devoted family man. Uh, he had ten kids. Uh, not all of whom survived because, you know, infant mortality was a lot higher back then. Uh, but still, I mean, he had this really big family. Um, when he, he worked at home, he was an independent scientist. He has, was a wealthy man and he basically devoted his life to studying nature. But any time the kids had come in, any of the children would come in, he would set aside his work and give that child full attention. Um, the Darwins were actually... Um, as, as opposed to this sort of dour, stodgy-looking uh, Victorian gentleman you see in all the pictures, they were actually quite, um, quite free-spirited when it came to uh, child rearing, and they believed in in a very permissive form of child rearing. And uh, from the accounts uh, that his children had written about, um, you know, their lives with Daddy and other visitors to uh, Down House, uh, apparently the place was quite chaotic. You know, with these ten kids running around, uh, raising the dickens and running in and out of the house and bouncing their balls. And, and yeah. one of the things that they did at the Darwin house is they built a big long stairway. Excuse me, they, they built a big long slide which they set up on the stairway of the central house so the kids could you know, <laughs> slide down the slide inside the house. You know, not, the, not, the, um, not the stodgy old Englishman yeah. that people think he is. <laughs> Probably was a pretty interesting character. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to interview you. My pleasure. And, Glad to uh, be here. On behalf of Notre Dame, thank you for coming. Well, I'm honored to be invited by such a fine uh, scholarly institution. Thanks. Such a good reputation. Thanks. Thank